spirit of shanti and peace across the world. Let us embark on this journey of reflection and learning, inspired by the wisdom of our fathers. As we gather here to dwell into the rich legacy of Mahatma Gandhi, let us begin this this celebration by rising for the national anthem. I request everyone to kindly rise. Mira, Linda, Mira, Linda. No, no, no. Insights 
into the realm of law and justice have not only made him a recall in the legal fraternity but also an inspiration for aspiring legal minds. We eagerly anticipate the valuable perspective he will share with us today. But before that, it is my privilege to speak a few words about the stellar career of our chief guest and keynote speaker for today. Justice Uday Umesh Dalit was born on November 9, 1957 in Solapur, Maharashtra. Justice Yuju Lalit enrolled as an advocate in June 1983. He specialized in criminal law and practiced at Bombay High Court from 1983 to 1985. Justice Lalit was designated as a serious senior advocate at Supreme Court in April 2004. He added the court as an amicus curiae in many important matters pertaining to forest, vehicular pollution and pollution of the Yumna River. And then Justice Lalit was elevated as a judge of the Supreme Court directly from the bar on August 13, 2014. And he was the sixth judge elevated directly to the Supreme Court without having served as a judge in a lower court or high court. As a judge of the Apex Court, he was appointed as the Executive Chairman of National Legal Service Authority in Alsa on May 14, 2021. And Honorable Mr. Justice Yunu Lalit was appointed as the Chief Justice of India on 27th August 2022 and retired on 8th November 2022. Now, sir, on behalf of the university <coughs> faculty, staff, and the students, I heartily welcome to you, sir, in HNU campus. My duty to extend a heartfelt welcome to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. B.C. Vivekanandan, sir, whose visionary leadership has been instrumental in steering our university towards excellence in the field of legal education. Under his guidance, our institution continues to thrive, and events like these underscore our commitment to academic enrichment in the larger interest of the students. I also welcome our extra Dr. Vipan Kumar, whose administrative acumen and dedication have played a pivotal role in the smooth functioning of our university. Welcome, you, sir. I extend a heartfelt welcome to the deans, the members of the faculty, the staff members who have joined us here today. Your hard work and dedication are one of the major drivers of the university. I also welcome members of the press and other distinguished guests who have come here to cover this important lecture. My most warm welcome to my beloved students of HNLU and other universities who are here today to listen to our dig to dignitaries and engage in fruitful deliberation later on. I would like to point out that the purpose of this Lecture series is to provide a platform for intellectual discourse and reflection, reminding us the values that form the bedrock of our legal and social fabric as we embark on this intellectual journey today. I encourage everyone present to engage actively in the discussions that follow, fostering an environment of dialogue and learning together. Let us draw inspiration from the ideals of Mahatma Gandhi and strive towards a more just, fair and equitable society. Once again, a warm welcome to each one of you with the hope that the third edition of the Mahatma Gandhi Memorial Lecture will light a spark in all of us and motivate us to build a better future for our nation. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Now request Professor Dr. B.C. Vivekananda, Honorable Vice Chancellor H.N.A.U. to deliver the opening remarks. The Chief Guest of today's event, Honorable Mr. Justice Yu Yu Lalit, former CJ of India and Distinguished Students Professor of H.N.A.U. 
Professor Yogendra Srivastava, Dean PG and Controller of Exams, Dr. Vipal Kumar, Registrar in Charge of HNRU, colleagues of HNRU, beloved students of HNRU, and students from Kalinga and ITM universities, media colleagues, and other guests who are assembled here. It's my pleasure and pride to give the opening remarks in two parts. One relating to the event of the day, and second, an essential introduction about the distinguished speaker who is today with us. The Mahatma Gandhi Memorial Lecture, instituted by HNLU in 2022, is running its third edition today. The topic chosen is an interesting interface of a technological regime complex epitomized by artificial intelligence and about a man who personifies simplicity and tradition by his looks, attire, speech and writings, that is Mahatma Gandhi. The theme of the memorial lecture given today in a way looks contrasting, juxtaposing or in Marxian words, a thesis and antithesis. But is it really true? is what we will explore in a memorial lecture and thereafter. I would like to literally borrow some thoughts from Ms. Vinita Patak in her article, Modern Technology in Gandhian Perspective. The term technology has its Greek ancestry as it is a combination of two Greek words, techne, which means art or craft, and logos, which means word or speech. Hence, Technology in ancient Greece meant a discourse on arts, both fine and applied. As such, the word technology has by now acquired a vast and a complex connotation, which we say science and technology, very, very different and away from arts. Early in the 17th century, Francis Bacon recognized three great technological innovations. The magnetic compass, the printing press and the gunpowder as distinguished achievements of modern man. He advocated experimental science as a means of enlarging man's dominion over nature. Bacon with Descartes and other contemporaries for the first time saw man becoming the master of nature. Technology created new tools and machines which the scientists made use for an ever-increasing insight into the natural world. Taken together, these developments brought technology to its modern and highly efficient level of performance, which artificial intelligence is also part of that. The new technology also augured well for the realization of an utilitarian ideal, which is called the greatest good of the greatest number. Socialist thinkers Marx and Engels also welcome technological progress. Similarly, early exponents of science fiction like Jules Verne and H.G. Wells highlighted the optimistic future based on emerging technologies. But later, when the technology juggernaut started rolling in a very, very big way, there were a lot of dissent and critique about this. It is Ralph Waldo Emerson who gave an ominous warning. He cautioned that the artifacts made by man in his camp campaign of conquest <laughs> over nature might get out of control and come to dominate him. H.G. Wells, earlier who praised a rosy picture of technology in his earlier novels, later became disillusioned with the dawn of the new kind of civilization and became a critique of that. In 1936, all of you will be aware and seen in modern times, Charlie Chaplin depicted the same kind of depersonalizing effect of the mass production on man. Here comes the greatest icon of our century, Mahatma Gandhi, who emerged as a freedom fighter, philosopher and thinker. He opined that his philosophy is there is an orderliness in the universe. There is an unalterable law governing everything and every being that exists or lives. For Gandhi, man's effort and responsibility to find his place 
in the harmonious and perfect cosmic plan constituted destiny or religion, whatever you may name it. He often cited his most favorite scripture, the Isha Upanishad, which he says that heaven itself can only be attained by reconciling life in this finite world with the infinity. As such, Gandhi revered nature and prayed for its indwelling spirit to purify and to heal you physically, mentally and spiritually. Gandhi maintained that nature in its economic wisdom instinctively fulfills the primary needs of hunger, shelter, procreation and growth. Therefore, he urged us to use only positive technology, the sun, air, water and earth as much as possible instead of continually and thoughtlessly squandering our non-renewable resources. This was in fact an ancient wisdom which now proves to be that Gandhi is a visionary of our times. Gandhi was a symbolic and person who talked about a holistic approach. He talked about the unity of God and nature becomes person. He argued that in its spiritual as well as respecting the cosmic enfoldment of life, he urged to be rational to work with nature, the material alma mater of life, that is nature, to value its irreplaceable resources and exercise restraint in doing anything contrary to natural law. Gandhi was dead against the motto of modern technology to have a mastery over nature. Instead, he wanted man to have mastery over himself. Gandhi, with this kind of ideal and approach to life, transcends stark materialistic worldview and he cannot accept the unbridled interplay of science and technology in man's life. Only that qualified and limited form which do not damage the human spirit and destroy the symbiotic relationship of worldly things and creatures are acceptable to Gandhi. It's true that Gandhi did not ex accept machine as an ideal form. His critique of modern civilization in the Hind Swaraj in 1908 is primarily an account of the fact it was created and sustained by modern technology. People are mad for labor saving machine to the extent that it produces unemployment. I quote Gandhi, I am not working for elimination of all machines, but for the moderation and control, unquote. According to him, the extent to which machines are not detrimental to humans capacity and personality or person, but they, instead of working complementarily and supplementarily to all human skill and stamina should not throw him out and kill the ingenuity and enterprise which cannot be tolerated. As early as 1925, Gandhi wrote, machines have their own place. Their existence has become permanent. Nevertheless, they can be permitted to take a place of human, they cannot be permitted to take a place of human labor. Even the displacement of labor is punishable crime. For this leads to unemployment, starvation, he said. He asserted, I cannot keep my human machines idle. I cannot keep my human machines idle. There is no place for power-driven machines for us with the enormous manpower lying useless. I would favor the use of the most elaborate machines if thereby India's pauperism and resulting idleness, idleness can be avoided. Several scholars, both in India and abroad, now feel how prophetic Gandhi was. The age of AI, interestingly, brings back some of these thoughts where he may not have imagined about AI, he brings that in the World Economic Forum recently. Ethical issues took center more than legal. As you said, many times there is a school of thought which says that all law is politics. But whereas ethics is something which transcends kind of politics. And in that particular thing, in the World Economic Forum, these things were reverberating. Number one, AI when we talk, unemployment, what happens after the end of jobs? Number two, inequality. How do we distribute the wealth created by machines? Number three, humanity. How do machines affect our behavior and interaction? Number four, artificial stupidity. How can we guard against mistakes? And number five, racist robots. How do we eliminate AI bias? Number six, 
evil genes, how do we protect against unintended consequences? Just go back to Gandhi and then talk about artificial intelligence. You will really see that here is a person, a deep thinker, much, much ahead, you know, decades ahead, probably is giving this warning shot. So this is one way we thought very interesting to kindle our today's memorial lecture on Gandhi to bring in the AI, which for us, we all love AI, right? All of us love AI. I think all of us are using chat GPT for projects and then, you know, teachers are struggling what to do with, you know, human ingenuity. Is that somebody else is doing this? So this is the age which we teachers are also living. So this is where I want to stop about the first part. But the second part, as uh, Professor Yogendra introduced the speaker in terms of his formal bio, I would like to speak about a distinguished speaker, about Justice Saru in the court, eight years and 85 days as a judge. Right? If I am mistaken, I have not used yet, so I might be mistaken one or two days. So, of which 72 days he was the Chief Justice of India. Apart from notable judgments and all these eight years, 85 days, the 72 days as a CGI was noticed and also was appreciated by many the way he incisively took some judgments. I just wanted to quote one or two. Pay to Kista Settlebaum on September 2nd, a bench headed by Honorable Justice granted interim relief to rights activist Kista Settlebaum who was arrested at the time by the police for an alleged conspiracy for sending innocent persons. I quote, he said, it's a matter of record that the appellant was remanded to police custody for about seven days and was interrogated every day by the concerned investigating machinery. Probably then Justice Bali said, it's enough to bail us be granted. The second case I would say, which I'm looking at very ordinary person, you know, knocking Supreme Court, paid to Sudiki Kapak. On September 9th, the bench headed by Honorable Justice granted bail to a journalist, Sudiki Kapak, in an unlawful activities prevention act case. He has been arrested in October 2020 while of, uh, he was heading somewhere on the charges of rape and murder of a Dalit teenager. And Justice asked the question, every person has the right to free expression. He is trying to show that the victim needs justice and raise a common voice. Is that a crime in the eyes of law? He said, while granting bail. And the last thing which I want to tell, which is basically on his last day in office, Justice Lalit was part of the five bench, five judge bench, upheld, which was upheld the EWS quota in three to two decision. But interestingly, the Chief Justice was a signatory to the dissenting opinion authored by Justice Ravindra Bhatt. This dissenting opinion stated that EWS quota, as it stands, violates the basic structure of the Constitution by being exclusionary, even though it is three to two. So that really shows about about how independent and incisive our Supreme Court judges are and how they do and especially as a Chief Justice, I just recollected the three when I was reading about uh, Honorable Jack and we are quite happy that uh, he is with us today. Sir, we are excited, elated, delighted and thrilled to have you as our speaker and importantly we urge you to be a frequent flyer to HMLD in the coming days to interact with students, scholars, and faculty. Thank you, sir. of today's lecture by your opening remarks. It is a distinct honor to have the presence of Honorable Mr. Justice Yudhu Dalit, former Chief Justice of India and distinguished jurist professor of HMLD, to deliver the third Mahatma Gandhi Memorial Lecture on law and ethics in the era of artificial intelligence, a Gandhian perspective. Honorable Sir, may I kindly request you to grace us with your lecture. Vivekanandan, Vice Chancellor of 
this university, Dr. Yogendra Kumar Srivastava, Dean Postgraduate Studies, and Dr. Vipin Kumar, the registrar in charge of this university, all the members of the faculty who are present today, the students who are present in large number, I was told that some of them are not exactly of this university, they have come from the other law colleges as well. Members of the print and electronic media, ladies and gentlemen. After what Dr. Vivekananda has said about artificial intelligence and Gandhian philosophy, perhaps I think I hardly have any ground to now build my case on. <laughs> Much has already been said. You know, there's a very beautiful foreword in the book of Palkiwala on income tax. Palkiwala wrote that retires at the age of 32. He was junior to Kanga, Jamshuti Kanga. And by sure respect that he had towards the senior, the authors read as Kanga and Palkiwala, not just Palkiwala. So Kanga said in the foreword that I feel like the owner of a horse who has won a derby. I was not even a trainer, I was not even a jockey, I did nothing. But I just took the horse to the podium to get the shield. So that is my contribution. So perhaps I think my contribution after Dr. Vivekanandan's lecture perhaps would be your, what Kanga felt in the matter. It is true that my career as a Chief Justice was very short, 72 days. My career as a distinguished jurist or professor, quote unquote, whatever it means, <laughs> has been even shorter. But yes, I am before you. And so therefore, I am learning that mantle very well. Let us now deal with this subject. You know, as a student of history of this country, normally what we see is that the freedom struggle of this country was spearheaded by Lokmanya Bal Gangadhar Tilak till his death, that is in 1920s. After which the mantle fell on the shoulders of Mahatma Gandhi. So he discharged all those obligations as leader from 1920 till 1947. So therefore, if we consider what is the contribution of Gandhi as against what was the contribution of Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Tilak introduced certain ideas like Ganesh Utsav, Tilak introduced the idea was to have congregation of people, the idea was to unite the people to have a cohesive force which will then stand up against the imperial kind of machinery. So Tilak did the groundwork, but Mahatma Gandhi went miles ahead. Ganesh Utsav would be only once in a year, at best 10 days in a year. Gandhi took the matter to a different level. It was more participative kind of movement on behalf of all the masses, where he gave tools like what is called satyagraha, non-violence, non-cooperation. These tools were neither to before by anyone. And the imperial machinery or the government was taken by surprise how to deal with this. Theoretically, it was nothing illegal, whatever he was doing. Whatever Tilak did by way of his writings in newspapers, Kesri and Maratha, at times were explosive. So therefore he was charged for an offense of sedition. 
whatever we see as students of law in that Kedarnath Singh, if you see Tilak on trial, a very beautiful book, you will see whatever address Tilak gave in defense is actually getting translated in the judgment in Kedarnath Singh. So Tilak, of course, had was on the wrong side of law on most of the occasions. Whereas Gandhi did a very beautiful exercise, which was a tightrope walk. That is to say, be on the right side of the law, and at the same time, do what is called Janajagriti. So therefore, his contribution towards our independence or the struggle for independence has been monumental. It is his ideas of non-violence, non-cooperation, or satyagraha became so unique that they were followed in Ghana, countries like Ghana, South Africa, with greater use and greater sort of utility. So Nelson Mandela chiseled it. So it has become something like a universal truth on this globe. So therefore, if we consider the first part, which is Tilak Sera, that was to ignite the idea of Swaraj. He said, Swaraj is my birthright. Second part of our Indian struggle for freedom was Gandhi's idea, not just Swaraj, but Ram Raj. And this is why he, he was captivated by the ideas such as the upliftment of the downtrodden. And that is why he used to be always worried about the lot of what we call Harijans. In his ashrams, he used to do a lot of constructive work on the social side as well. So therefore, his emphases were on what we call Ramraj, to abolish untouchability, the evils of that. Do you know this, that as students of law, we go through constituent assembly debates. The article which said that untouchability stands abolished, when that article, draft article, the debates happened, and when it was adopted unanimously, the House rose in unanimous kind of you know, uproar and said, Mahatma Gandhi ki jai. So therefore, that's the tribute which our founding fathers gave to the father of the nation. So therefore, this is what the acknowledgment which came from resoundingly by all the founding fathers. That shows the kind of the architect for what is called modern India. So therefore, he led the roadmap for what is then becomes, has become the ethos subsequently. So the second stage, I would say, 20 to 1947. And look at the selflessness of the man. After the freedom was achieved, he did not aspire for any governmental post. He was not even in the capital the day we attained independence. He was in Noakhali. So therefore, that shows the kind of approach the man had towards what are the ideals. When you say what are the ideals, again, one distinguishing feature of Mahatma Gandhi has always been purity of means as much as purity of end. So therefore, means and end both must be given equal importance. It is precisely for this reason that Quit India Movement which was started at the call given by Mahatma Gandhi. He suspended the moment, the moment there were riots in some of the parts of the country. Yes, he could not tolerate the idea that there could be violence. His idea was that let there be non-violent protest. So therefore, means were equally important for the man, purity of means. You know what is the motto of Supreme Court? Yato dharmas tato jaya. What does that mean? That the path of righteousness, whatever is right, must prevail. That was a 
It was essentially an ashirwad given by Gandhari to her son Duryodhan when he went for Mahabharat Yuddha, the final war. The son went up to the mother and was anxious to get a good ashirwad saying that Vijayi Bhava, but the mother did not give that kind of ashirwad to the son. Nor did she say Vijay, Vijay, Jayostute or Vijayi Bhava. Her ashirwad or ashirvachan were Yato dharmas tato jayaha. If you have been right in your path of life, if righteousness is there, then the victory shall be towards or on the side of right. And that is the ethos of our country. When we say rule of law, what do we mean? We mean that, you know, the societal structure, the behavior, the relationship between the citizens of the country or between the citizens on one side and the state apparatus on the other must be governed by set of rules. The means are also equally important. This idea actually emanates from our Puranas, Mahabharata itself. So therefore, that's the ethos with which we see the life. And that's the ethos which Gandhian philosophy also fostered. So therefore, the Gandhian philosophy right up to 47 is something which ignited, which carried our freedom struggle. Then the third stage. According to me, the third stage was the framing of the Constitution and getting all Indian states and principalities under one single umbrella. The chief architects in that would be Dr. Ambedkar when it comes to constitutional front. And the other man to have the republic in this country is Sardar Vallabhbhai Patel. So therefore, these two gentlemen principally carried the mantle and saw that the Gandhian ideology or the philosophy gets a concrete shape in the matter of or in the form of a guiding document for the progeny, for the destiny of this nation. So therefore comes the third stage, which is framing of the Constitution. And if you see some of the articles in the Constitution, they are direct translation of Gandhian philosophy. That is to say, abolition of untouchability. Some of the other articles, especially in directive principles of state policy, there are these articles which find mention. There is one area where perhaps Gandhian ideology was not accepted by our founding fathers. Gandhian ideology was that village panchayat should be what is called the principal units. And this is exactly what Dr. Vivekanandan actually spoke about. The ideal vehicles for democracy where participative action can be initiated and can be fostered would be at the village level. So therefore, let there be village panchayats who will be the primary houses. And according to Gandhi, the state legislatures must be elected through indirect method. That is to say, all village panchayat representatives in turn may elect state legislature or state legislative members. We did not accept that. But again, by 73rd, 74th Amendment, village panchayats were given what is called the constitutional status. So perhaps I think a wrong which was committed by the founding fathers at the initial stage was corrected sometime in 92. So therefore, this is what, again, therefore, what you will find at every stage the structure of the Constitution, the documentation of that basic document is guided by Gandhian philosophy. So therefore, that, according to me, was the third stage. Having adopted and having given to ourselves a basic document, the Constitution, the next level would be the journey of this nation to achieve what is called justice, social, political, and economic. And the struggle has always been in that direction. So one can say right from 1947 or 50, when the Constitution got adopted, our struggle has always been on that front. 
And now we are entering what is called the next level, which is scientific development. Who would have thought 100 years back that this country would send a vehicle on the moon? Who would have thought that this country would be a predominant and a dominant partner or player in what is called missile technology? Who would have thought that this country could attain scientific kind of levels the way this country has achieved? Do you know our country is quite unique? That today mobile technology, which is actually in this country, has gone to such a level that charges of mobile are at the lowest when it comes to all over the world. And today, every person in this country, the Republic, now can say with pride that he is having a mobile you know, in his pocket. The second, digitization. Every person, whether it is Chaiwala, Fulwala, or Mali, now has what is called you know, digital pay connections. So therefore, this is where our scientific development has taken us. This is what the Gandhian philosophy of all-inclusiveness is something which is spoken of. What did this country do during COVID times? It, you know, it gave vaccine to every citizen free of cost. There's no other country on the globe which, which even attempted that kind of exercise. So in a country of 140 crore population, you even think of having giving, giving vaccines to everyone, every citizen, free of cost. And that's the ideology, that's the ethos, which is called Gandhian philosophy. Gandhian philosophy is what? When we say, Vaishnava janato tene kahiye, pida parai jane re. So therefore, sarv bahujana hitaya, bahujana sukhaya. So therefore, your attempts must be to see that you reach at the lowest levels of the social structure. It is very beautifully said in one of the sentences by Mahatma Gandhi that in case you are in doubt at any stage when you are exercising administrative power or judicial power, think of the man at the lowest level of the societal structure and see whether your actions are going to benefit that man or not. So therefore, when you interpret your actions, when you want the causal connections, so far as your actions are concerned, go by that man as the parameter. And whether your actions will bring a smile on that face or not. This is what our Gandhian philosophy has been. And this is what we have adopted in our national posture. Very well. Now we are in for development, quantum development. I used to consider that there's a very beautiful picture of Mahatma Gandhi. Some of you must have seen that. That in that era, Gandhi is looking through a microscope. And the joy on his face, that when he sees certain things under the lens of a microscope, which are otherwise not visible to naked eye, the joy on his face is something which is beautiful. And it's very difficult to express that. That is why many political thinkers used to say that Gandhi is what? Is he a saintly figure? Is he a philosopher? Is he a politician? It was all combined in one, one single individual. And that is exactly what Gandhi meant for this country. Very well. Now, what is artificial intelligence? In the perspective that we are considering the contributions of this man, I used to consider that artificial intelligence very well in the field of medical science. When you have MRI, it gives a clear report to the doctor concerned immediately. What exactly is the ailing factor in the body of that patient? Very well. When it comes to games like chess, Vishwanathan Anand could play against a computer. So therefore, algorithms could be fed into the computer, into that machine. And that machine could, given the parameters, would come out with answers 
which would be helpful for the mankind. You know, few years back, open heart surgery was supposed to be a preserve for those who were rich persons. Over a period of time, open heart surgery, that is to say, open your rib cage and chest, has become an obsolete feature now. Today, heart surgeries are actually conducted through what is called a, a monitoring system where you don't even have to open the rib cage. There are many operations which are done by doctors purely through what is called machines. Now, these machines are trying to ease the human life. So therefore, when we speak of artificial intelligence, should we not have the artificial intelligence of the same level which would ease, which would make our life simpler, easier? And that is exactly what, ultimately, we will reach the final persons in the ladder of the societal structure. If we have, just as we have ensured through our mobile telephony, through our UPay, that even the smallest of the persons cannot be deprived of the technological advantages. Similarly, if the artificial intelligence can be utilized for the benefit, for the good of the society, and it benefits even the smallest of the persons, then certainly yes. Then we will be paying great tribute to the person who said, that you must be guided by the face of that man who is the lowest and the lowliest. Whether your actions will bring the smile of happiness on that face or not. If you do that, certainly yes. Now it is true, why did Mahatma Gandhi, and this is exactly what Dr. Vivekanandan said, he was not opposed to what is called industrialization. Did it mean that the moment he was doing charkha and, you know, trying to weave some kind of, you know, the, the suit on that charkha, does that mean that he was opposed to industrialization of machines? He was not. What he meant to say was that at the lowest levels of the society, it is not necessary to have the wheels of industrialization reaching there. The societal structure, the panchayats, can be self-sufficient. Industrialization should not mean that there must be a migration from rural sectors to the cities or to the bigger towns. So there are, our fabric, the social fabric, must remain the same. If the social fabric is maintained the way it is, that is to say village panchayats, that's why he advocated that village panchayats should be the democratic models at the lowest levels. So therefore, let them take decisions, participative democracy at that level. And then thereafter, you build on that edifice. You build on that foundation. So therefore, your democratic principles can therefore, thereafter be structured on that basis. But the man was not against machines. So that's exactly why in today's world, when we speak of what shall be the ethics, what shall be the law, in this today's world, and whether do we have to go by Gandhian philosophy or do we have to just drop that philosophy? According to me, that philosophy is something which is everlasting. If that is an everlasting philosophy, ultimate truth, then there's no way that we can barter away that kind of philosophy. The philosophy is what? Satyagraha, that go by the truth, your means must also be equally pure. And your attempt must be to have common good. If you have that, then whether you are in artificial intelligence sphere or in the era where artificial intelligence would be taking care of most of the functions, it hardly makes any difference. Your societal structure would always be the same. The societal structure must be guided by what is called common good. And if it is to be guided by that, then it makes no difference whether the artificial intelligence takes care of or takes over many functions. Just as we have seen in medical field, just as we have seen. Now, today's world is such that if a particular missile comes from across the border, your radars catch that. 
your radars not only catch that, they ignite a process by which a counter kind of, you know, missiles that can be fired immediately. So this is all part of your artificial intelligence network. So we have been utilizing this artificial intelligence network to our advantage in almost every walk of life. It doesn't mean that we are now actually entering an era where we need to drop all our what are called past ideas or philosophies. We just need to chisel them. We just need to build on them. We just need to improve upon them. If we improve upon them, and if we go by that logic, that what Mahatma Gandhi said, go by the face of that lowliest man, then perhaps I think your attend achievements will certainly be in the right direction. So therefore, your achievements will be guided by not just the means, but the end as well. And that, to my mind, perhaps I think, when we speak of law and ethics in today's world, the law and ethics will certainly be of the same level. The only thing is, at times, there could be certain course correction but that doesn't mean that we must drop those ideas. The basic ideas will remain the same. The structure may slightly undergo modifications. So therefore, ultimately what? Do we need to say that artificial intelligence is something which is, which is going to be such a tremendous change in the society that it will take us by an avalanche? I don't think so. Just as we have adopted to mobile uh, telephony, just as we have adopted to laptops and other machines, it will also become part of our life. <laughs> Ultimately, what is important is human touch. Human touch, brotherhood, fraternity, cooperation amongst the citizens, and to be guided by the basic philosophy of the Constitution. If we have that, then there is nothing such as which can stop us and law and ethics will always remain identical, same in any era, and will still be guided by what is called the Gandhian philosophy. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for an insightful lecture. Your perspectives have indeed enriched our understanding of the Gandhian philosophy, and especially why and how to be there on the right side of law.